Welcome, everyone. We are today back in Lausanne for the second day of the Sustainable Space Logistics Digital Symposium. I hope you all had a great rest since yesterday. For those who were not there, I will just make you a quick summary of what happened yesterday. We had some introduction remarks from Renato Caprun, Head of Swiss Space Office, and Professor Kneipp, Director of eSpace, EPFL Space Center. They explain why we have a problem and how the Sustainable Space Logistics Initiative will uh, try to participate in solving uh, that problem that we have and that there is no plan B and there is a huge to, to, to act. Simonetta Di Pipo, uh, director of the uh, UN uh, Corpus, um, also explained how the UN sustainability goals uh, should be a guidance for space activities as well as, well as the European Green Deal and uh, provided also concrete steps to environmental stewardship in space exploration. Uh, these steps were described by Pascal Ehrenfreund, president of the International Astronautical Federation. We also had then also opening remarks from Rudiger Albat from the European Space Agency, who could give us also actual example how the European uh, Space Agency act in that matter meaning uh, developing a green spaceport, uh, using eco-design, space debris management, on orbit, developing on-orbit servicing uh, capabilities, and also working in developing green propellant technologies. Finally, we had a final discussion moderated by Thorsten Kreening from Spacewatch Global with Thomas Schilnek, uh, Roxy Gullmeister, and Marcus uh, Mus-Lechner, who gave also a look from non-space industry observer on uh, the situation and how sustainability should be addressed. And they also um, ur um, gave a, a strong word on the urgency and the need to act rather than think. They also asked for more transparency on what we call space sustainability and also discussed and provided a recommendation on how to better communicate uh, to the public, to the citizens. All those three sessions are available on our YouTube channel and you can watch them again after uh, this session. <clears throat> I'm really happy to kick off now day number two. Before starting to present uh, the outline of the day, I'd like to remind a few housekeeping rules. Uh, first, we are kindly asking you to cut off your camera, please. Videos, as I mentioned, will be available on our YouTube channel tomorrow, so you can always look at them again. The biography of our speakers are available on our website, so if you want to know more about their background, I um, recommend you to look there. And finally, if you have questions throughout the, the, the talks, you can ask them through the chat, and then I will be asking them to the keynote and to the panel. And now let's go to today's, uh, today's program. First, we will be hearing a keynote from Professor De Vec, at, uh, who is a professor at MIT, professor of aeronautics and astronautics and engineering systems. The name of his talk is Space Logistics Enabler of the Final Frontier. Then we'll have a talk from DHL on the logistics transformation from a cost category to a strategic lever by Klaus Dorman, Vice President, Sector Development for DHL Customer Solutions and Innovation. And then we'll conclude that day with a great panel discussion moderated by Maxime Puto from Euroconsult, featuring uh, speakers from DRBIT, OrbitFab, Ion Group, and Astroscale on the topic New Space enabling agile space logistics. And now I give the floor to Professor Devec for the first keynote of day number two. Oh, good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be with you. My name is Olivier Devec, <clears throat> Oli for short. And uh, as was introduced, I'm a professor here at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston. Um, I also have an adjunct appointment at EPFL, and so it's a great honor to be speaking with you. Um, let me share my application, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you can see my screen, if I could just get a quick confirmation that it looks okay. Thank you very much. So, um, 
I want to thank a number of people before I start. I want to thank uh, Professor Jean-Paul Kneipp, uh, the director of eSpace. Um, I want to thank Claude Nicolier, who I saw online, who's been, I think, a great, great role model, a mentor, and a friend to me in space exploration research. Emmanuel Vincent Candice, the staff from eSpace. I also want to acknowledge the new space innovation initiative at EPFL and uh, Professor Volker Gass and his staff. So it's really exciting to see the interest in space logistics uh, that we're discussing in this three-day symposium. My own journey with space logistics started quite a while ago in 2004, when in the US, uh, the administration at that time initiated a new program called Constellation to return to the moon, explore Mars with humans and settle Mars. Um, and we're still talking about that today. At the time, they were looking for new ideas for how to do this sustainably. And myself and some colleagues, uh, for example, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, submitted a proposal to NASA that we called interplanetary supply chain management. We were almost 100% sure that this proposal was going to get rejected because interplanetary supply chain management sounds almost like science fiction, doesn't it? But to our pl uh, pleasure and surprise, they accepted it. And, um, and so we started doing research and thinking about space logistics as really an en enabler of this final frontier uh, for the last 15 years. So I'm really happy to, to share with you uh, what we've learned in this journey so far. And I'd like to start with a little bit of history, not in space, but on Earth. I want to take you back to 1914 to 1916 when it wasn't necessarily space, but it was Antarctica that was the ultimate frontier for exploration. The picture that you see here is from the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition uh, that was planned for 1914 to 16 and learned, led by Sir Ernest Shackleton. It, the South Pole had already been reached, so what was left to be discovered? Well, what hadn't been done was to traverse the Antarctic continent from one end to the other. And so uh, Shackleton had an ingenious idea, which is to have two parties go from both sides, and one party would uh, place supplies every one degree. So every 60 nautical miles, they would put a cache of supplies so that um, the party that was traversing could then pick up these supplies on the backside. Uh, so this was the key concept of prepositioning. Unfortunately, this expedition failed in a dramatic fashion, and many books have been written about it, movies have been made about it. And why did it fail? Because while the idea was good, it was poorly executed. Poor logistics planning, no communications, and poor physical preparation. And if you want to learn more about this, uh, I recommend a book called Shackleton's Lost Men by Kelly Tyler, which tells this uh, story in quite a dramatic fashion. Um, but things did improve. In fact, uh, there's a very nice book on Antarctica called The International Politics of Antarctica by Peter Beck. And so I'm just going to quote a sentence from this book. Antarctic science is dependent on logistics on the ability to place and maintain a scientist and their equipment at the right place at the right time. After 1925, the development of mechanized transport, the airplane, radio, and technology uh, improved the ability and the survival in this hostile environment much, and it led to a dramatic uh, improvement in Antarctic exploration. The graph that I'm showing you here is my best attempt at reconstructing how many expeditions to Antarctica took place between the early 1800s and roughly 1960, which is when our space logistics story will begin. And so the year 1925 is shown in red, and you can see the different, it wasn't a, a continuous process, it's not a smooth curve, it looks more like a staircase, and you see the different periods of Antarctic exploration. There was an initial discovery period, tentative and mainly coastal uh, in the 1820s and 1830s. Then not much happened for about 50 years. 
Then there was the heroic age of Antarctic exploration in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Amundsen reaches the South Pole in 1911. And then after 1925, when technology like airplanes, communications, mechanized transport really became available, you can see a dramatic rise in the number of expedition. And this allowed for in-depth exploration of the Antarctic continent enabled by logistics and by technology. And you see that by 1957, the International Geophysical Year, um, the Antarctic Research and Exploration Enterprise was well established. And so my, my hypothesis I wanna share with you is that space logistics is playing a similar role than Antarctic logistics played more than 100 years ago. And so the timeline I wanna discuss with you here is starting now in 1957, Sputnik, the International Geophysical Year. <clears throat> and then we see all of these campaigns on the bottom chart. We are today, of course, in uh, 2021, uh, but we've had the Apollo program, the Space Shuttle, um, Skylab, Mir, the International Space Station for the 20, last 20 years. China has had um, a space station like Tiangong-1, and its successors. Uh, we're now talking about Artemis returning to the moon, building a lunar village, establishing a Martian base by 2060, and also the future of the International Space Station. So what I wanna do next is explain to you what is space logistics, how is it different, and what are the challenges compared to terrestrial logistics? The speaker that will succeed me is from DHL, um, I'm a huge fan of DHL, by the way. Uh, they do a great job. Um, but there are some differences between terrestrial and space logistics. Then I want to briefly mention some of the research contributions from our group at MIT uh, in space logistics and, and talk about where the future is going in this, in this field. So first of all, a definition. What is space logistics? So here's a definition that was created and adopted by the AIAA, that's the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, Space Logistics Technical Committee, which I had the pleasure of chairing between 2008 and 2010. So the definition is that space logistics is the theory and practice of driving space system design for operability, managing the flow of material, services, and information needed throughout the space system life cycle. And you can see what falls, examples of what falls under this definition, ISS resupply, campaign analysis, which I'll talk about, in-space refueling, asset management in space, and of course, launch logistics. So many years ago, when you, people heard space logistics, primarily they were thinking about what's happening at the launch port, uh, the logistics required to launch rockets, that's part of it for sure, but we're also much more interested now in what's happening logistically in space. So you see this definition is quite a broad one. So if we think about uh, terrestrial supply chains, we're quite good at it now, and especially during the pandemic, you know, logistics is what's, what's keeping us alive, what keeps our, our economy going. And so there are tools available for supply chain network design and then supply chain network analysis and optimization. The tool that you see on this picture is called LogicNet. It's one of the premier uh, software environments for companies to optimize their supply chain on earth. You know, where to put warehouses, where are the customers, how much inventory to keep in different warehouses. Uh, this software LogicNet, by the way, was originally created at MIT uh, then sold to IBM and was very recently acquired by a company called Lamasoft, who is a world leader in logistics and supply chain design software. So the question we asked some years ago is, is it possible to create a similar mindset and a similar planning environment for space logistics? And the answer is yes, but you have to look at the comparison of terrestrial or commercial logistics and space exploration. And so uh, there are very similar concepts. Concept number one, the idea of networks. So in terrestrial commercial uh, logistics, we have nodes, 
which are suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, and retailers, well, we have nodes in space too. Uh, those are the launch sites, the orbital nodes and depots, surface exploration. We have arcs. So on Earth, the arcs are our transportation links, trucks, rail, air, barges, cargo ships. Well, in space, we have propulsion, uh, chemical or electric propulsion mainly, but you can also think about solar sails and other ways and nuclear thermal propulsion. We have, what are we actually transporting? So this is our supply items and the demand. So the idea of push-pull between demand and supply. In commercial, you have so-called SKUs, shopkeeping units. Those are the numbers. If you pick up any product in the store, you can see it has a unique number on it. That's the SKU number. Well, in space, as you will see, we have uh, classes of supply. Uh, we have demand. In space, the demand comes not from customers in the traditional sense, even though we are creating a space economy, but demand for supplies comes during in-space transit and while we're exploring on, on, let's say, a planetary surface. And then the third concept is that of lean design. Uh, in terrestrial commercial systems, we have modular and hopefully easily upgradable products. In space, what we need are modular and easily maintainable vehicles and systems. And so while the specifics differ, um, the fundamental concepts between terrestrial and space logistics are really uh, still valid. Now, there are some challenges that are unique to space logistics, and I'll mention now three of them. The first one is time varying launch opportunities. So if you think about it, uh, and we're going to hear from DHL, and they have an amazing set of vehicles and assets available. But by and large, you can travel anytime you want to any point on Earth. You can fly tomorrow, you can fly two days from now. As long as the weather permits that, it's possible. That is not true in space. So what I'm showing you here are the famous pork chop plots. This is essentially the launch windows that open up between Earth and Mars every 26 months. And so um, many, many organizations have calculated these. We've done that as well. This is a paper um, that we published some years ago on the 2020 to 2040 Earth to Mars launch windows. Uh, these include also Venus flyby opportunities. And you can see these contours show you the C3, that's the departure, the energy you need to escape Earth's gravity, okay? And so uh, the mission that is arriving at Mars tomorrow, the Mars 2020 mission, actually took this launch window that we see here. And so uh, this is the launch window that was used and the launch actually happened on July 20th. And you can see then the arrival at Mars uh, now in mid-February. So we can only launch in when the planets line up. That's what I'm trying to say. Another big challenge in space logistics is what I call nested complexity and object hierarchy. Because space is such a harsh environment, we need to really protect uh, all the items that we ship from Earth. The, the words that you see here are words from different uh, reports, different um, logistics systems, and it's very confusing. We have pockets, containers, lockers, SRUs, LRUs. It's an acronym soup. And if I show you a picture, this is, I guess, historical now, from the space shuttle as a logistics system, you see that supply items are packed in bags, are packed in racks, are packed, for example, inside the MPLM. This is the multi-purpose logistics module that went inside the shuttle bay. So it's almost like Russian dolls. And we're doing that to really make sure that this precious cargo gets to the destination. And one of the uh, unfortunate consequences of this is that the actual net cargo mass fraction, meaning the percent cargo that's actually useful compared to the total mass that you're launching is very small. In fact, it's less than 1%. And so that's a big challenge. And then the third challenge, which we experience in microgravity. So this is a picture from inside the International Space Station. This is one of uh, a, a colleague here, an astronaut looking 
to find his way through this. In space, in microgravity, everything floats. So if you have trouble finding uh, you know, your items, your stuff on Earth in a two-dimensional world, imagine everything floating in 3D with air currents. So finding your assets, finding your items is very, very challenging. So there's an asset management system on board the space station, and it's jointly, it's actually jointly operated by um, the different players like NASA, Russia. So you can see some Cyrillic uh, written in this, in, this, uh, in this application, but it's quite manual. It requires a lot of constant care and feeding to uh, do automated real-time asset management. It's a big challenge, and we're still improving, but struggling with it. Okay, so, so those are some of the unique challenges of space logistics. Now, in terms of how can we, um, how, how have we made progress and how can we think of space logistics in a more scientific and a more organized way? So one of the things we've done over the years is to de develop a, um, let's call it a modeling and simulation environment. I mentioned to you LogicNet, which is used for terrestrial supply chain planning. Um, this is SpaceNet. So SpaceNet is essentially a, a planning and simulation environment for space logistics missions and campaigns. And um, it basically looks at space exploration from a logistics perspective. Under the hood, it is a discrete event simulation that allows us to look at individual missions or campaigns, which are strings of missions. We can evaluate um, exploration scenarios. We can visualize the flow of the vehicles, the elements, the agents through the system, and we can also optimize and do trade studies. And this is available as an open, uh, open source uh, GNU license. So the building blocks of SpaceNet are very much what we've already talked about. We have nodes. Nodes can be surface nodes on the, on the Earth, surface nodes on Mars, surface nodes on the Moon, or near-Earth objects. They can be orbital um, locations, or they can be the so-called Lagrange points or libration points. We have objects flowing through the system, supply items, elements, crew, and agents. Could be robotic agents. We have a network. Uh, in this case, it has to be a time-expanded network because not all the links are always available, as I've explained. And then we have events that can occur. And it turns out that you can model anything you need in space logistics just with these five events listed here, create, transfer, remove, reconfigure, and demand. Those are the five classes of events that allow you to really simulate and model and plan any, any mission from a logistics perspective. So the way this works is we have an event stack, we read the events, we execute the events virtually. This alters the state of the system, moving things around, consuming things, creating things. And of course, we can add them to the stack um, as we go through, through the system. And so I'm going to show you uh, what that looks like in practice. The key is not to treat mass just like mass, but we want to actually know what it is that's flowing through the network. Is it uh, crew provisions? Is it waste? Is it spare parts? Is it tools? Is it scientific equipment? That's really important to actually know what it is that you need and what you need, what you, what you're actually manifesting. So um, SpaceNet is written in Java in the Java language, you know, and it has a fairly straightforward interface where you can step through the network definition, the missions, generate demands. You can manifest things on different vehicles and then essentially simulate to see whether your mission or campaign is is feasible. Feasible not just uh, from a policy perspective, but feasible from a from a logistical perspective. And so I'll come back to some of the missions and campaigns we've been able to analyze using this um, this software and this approach. What's also very important, and and people in terrestrial supply chains use metrics, figures of merit, to judge how strong, how capable is the logistics system. And so to do this for space exploration. We've defined some figures of merit that may be, let's say, unusual that we don't typically see on Earth. One of these is called exploration capability. 
fundamentally what it is, it's the product of mass that you deliver to the destination, like uh, a lunar south base, south polar uh, base on the south pole of the moon, multiplied by the number of crew days. So how many days, how many astronauts can spend at that node? And it's the combination of mass delivered and enabling crew days that gives you exploration capability. I'm not gonna go through the equations in detail here, but you can see some references to our, our papers on, this, uh, on these metrics. And then an interesting one is to normalize that. So we call that relative exploration capability, but the most advanced exploration that we've ever been able to do with humans on a planetary surface, and I will say that's Apollo 17. And so here's a picture of Apollo 17 in 1972. Apollo 17 spent three full days on the lunar surface with two astronauts and pushed the boundaries, the limits of that system to its ultimate edge. They were counting, you know, band-aids in the medical kit to make sure that they didn't have, you know, 10 grams too much mass on the vehicle. And so we use Apollo 17 to normalize essentially future missions and future campaigns. And so if you plot exploration capability versus total launch mass, you see Apollo 17 here on the left uh, and single sortie missions, campaigns of sortie missions. But what we really want is to reuse material and equipment that was sent on prior missions. Nothing in Apollo was reused on later missions. And so in order to get to higher levels of efficiency, higher levels of what we call relative exploration capability. The key is that we deliver things like supplies and elements, but we keep reusing them over and over. That's the key. And so if you think about it, what's happening is a paradigm shift. In Apollo, we had um, very successful carry along missions. So it's like a big backpack. You carry everything you need, and you eat from the backpack, and when you come back, you have almost nothing left. That's, that's very simple, but the disadvantage is you don't leave anything behind for future missions. The ISS is almost the inverse of that. We have one node in space, and now we have many uh, supply locations. In fact, more than just these two, we're launching from five different places on Earth. But the future looks like this. The future is a network a network where we're combining pre-positioning, carry along, and resupply. And so you can see this network emerging. And it brings up a lot of questions like, you know, what is the ideal mix of carry along, resupply, and pre-positioning? Uh, what are the demand drivers for human crews in space? Um, what's the role of environmental control and life support systems, meaning recycling, in situ resource utilization and propulsion technologies? And how do these key decisions interact in a bigger strategic way? So let me show you a couple of the scenarios we've been able to look at. Uh, some are happening and some are more uh, hypothetical. Of course, we're all familiar with ISS resupply. This has been a major operation and very successful. This is an example of a Mars campaign with robotic precursors. So three robotic precursors to choose the first human landing site. The lower left shows you a lunar outpost scenario at the South Pole, uh, very close to what's being considered now for a lunar village. And then my favorite is the one on the lower right. This is a lunar global nomadic exploration scenario. And the way this works is you have a, a lunar exploration crew with a pressurized rover they explore part of the lunar surface and they carry with them the ascent vehicle. After you've done with your leg, you launch and the next crew lands where the previous crew left off and does the next leg. So gradually over time, you can explore the whole lunar surface, probably the front side that we can see because the moon is phase locked and you would explore all the way from the North to the South Pole. Clearly a very challenging scenario but a very exciting one. So if we now look at these four scenarios, we can see the increased levels of complexity. You can see the number of nodes, edges, the number of missions, the number of events, the different types of vehicles or elements involved, 
and the duration of the whole campaign. And clearly, this shows you how really challenging the Mars exploration campaign will be over seven, almost 7,000 days, uh, 21 missions, 337 key mission events, uh, 234 different element types. And that's why, why going to Mars is, and going to the surface of Mars is really such a big deal. And all of this needs to be synchronized very carefully. So I'm just gonna two more minutes and, and love to have some of your questions. So campaigns involve hundreds of events over thousands of days. And it's clear now that bringing everything from Earth is not sustainable. We need to think of this as a supply chain network in space. And so we've continued the research in space logistics by looking at it from a network perspective. And if you look at it from a network perspective, like it's shown here, you can also think about where can we get resources in places other than Earth? Because shipping everything from Earth is not sustainable. And so think about um, uh, gas stations like fuel depots in space. Think about refineries in space. And so if you formulate this as a mathematical generalized uh, flow problem, you can actually optimize, depending on your objective function, uh, where you launch, where you get the resources, and to create, and I understand yesterday's theme was sustainable space logistics, create a sustainable network in space. And so some of the research we've done on this, particularly uh, understanding better the role of the moon, you know the moon um, has some water in the permanently shaded craters, we're pretty sure of that, but there's also oxygen tied up in the metal oxides of the regolith. Can we free that oxygen? Can we use that oxygen for breathing? Can we use that oxygen as a propellant? And so we've shown that in some cases, when your oxygen extraction capability is good enough, like shown in the upper right chart, it turns out that going to Mars could be better, not directly, but via the moon. First, you go to the moon, you get resources uh, at the moon, particularly oxygen, and then you go to Mars from the moon and not from Earth directly. And that turns out to be, in some cases, a massive, massive improvement over the traditional way of thinking. And we've shown that it's possible to save up to 68% of mass by using lunar resources. And so to finish up, it's a very exciting time for all of us. And particularly at MIT, uh, together with JPL, we're very excited about MOXIE. Uh, MOXIE is on board the uh, Perseverance rover, which arrives on Mars tomorrow, Thursday, at uh, 2055 uh, GMT. What is MOXIE? It's uh, essentially a technology demonstration experiment on board the rover. You can see it's shown here in the front right portion. And uh, we've worked uh, on this project for several years. And its purpose is to demonstrate oxygen extraction, not from ice, not from the regolith, but from the atmosphere of Mars, which is, of course, made up of CO2. So the way that MOXIE works is it acquires the CO2 from the Martian atmosphere, it compresses the CO2, puts it through a heat exchanger, so it heats it up, and then it separates, it splits the CO2 molecules. So the carbon monoxide is expelled and the oxygen atom that is retained um, is, is, um, is metered, is checked, and eventually will be liquefied. There's no liquefact liquefaction right now on MOXIE, but there will be in the future. This is quite a power intensive process, as you can see here, but uh, the technology demonstration on the Mars rover will give us a lot of insights for how to best scale up this kind of oxygen generation capability. So stay tuned. I hope you get to watch the landing tomorrow, and we're very excited about it. So to finish up, uh, space key points I want you to remember is that we, we are witnessing a paradigm shift from a mission-centric to a network-centric approach. Pioneering space further with humans will require traditional technologies like ECLIS, but also new technologies like in-situ resource utilization. Um, lunar plus Mars in-situ resource utilization has massive potential to save mass 
so that we have to launch less from Earth. But a lot more work is needed in, uh, in these ISRU technologies, solar electric propulsion. Um, you know, the question if, if, if we reduce launch cost even further from Earth, what happens then? Uh, understanding how technologies interact, doing further research on where the resources are in space, and then finally, which I think you'll talk about tomorrow, is clarifying the underlying legal frameworks. So with that, I know it was quite fast, but I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. That was indeed very interesting, and I think we have a few questions from the audience. So I'll read the first one. So on the revolution in terrestrial logistic was the adoption of the container as a standard. Do you think there could be a similar revolution in space logistics introducing some similar sort of standardization? Um, well, I will say that we already have this. It's actually already happened. It's not as well known or advertised, but when you look at, um, and this was definitely true during the shuttle era, and it's still true to some extent, these, uh, these bags that I showed you, the way that cargo mm -hmm. is packaged, so the MO2 bags. So a lot of the logistics at the lower level is, it's not the huge shipping containers, 53 feet, but the smaller uh, shipping and packaging containers are standardized. So the Russians, the Europeans, the Americans, the Japanese are synchronizing their logistics. So we already have it to some extent, but the price that you pay is that the packing efficiency is not as high as it could be. So there's a trade-off between standardization and efficiency. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I didn't uh, also think it that way. That's a really great insight. Other question, and I think it's also links to what you were saying in your conclusion in the decreasing of prices. Uh, one person asked, uh, what is your view on super heavy launchers like Starship that are aiming to reduce launch cost to ten dollar per kilogram in Leo, do they remove the need of nodes? Okay, so it's a great question. You know, I'm many of my former students work at SpaceX now on different programs, so I'm extremely impressed. What what um, it's and rem remember, we always give Elon Musk all the credit. Elon Musk is definitely the visionary, but there are thousands of people working for Elon Musk. Who are the ones actually making making it happen? So let's give let's give them some credit too. Um, the Falcon 9 has reduced the launch cost by a factor of three. Uh, Elon Musk promised us a factor of ten about a decade ago. Now a factor of three or four is amazing, and it's going to continue improving. But um, it's ten dollars per kilo. We're we're very very far from that. So I really urge some realism here. <laughs> And you know, uh, let's let's uh, think about the lowering launch costs, for sure. But it's going to take decades for us to reach these levels. Um, and so, in the meantime, we need to have kind of mixed strategies, uh, including using resources and gaining resources at the destination. Thank you. Um, other question, we were mentioning that DHL could uh, travel um, and perform their transport anytime, just depending on the weather. Someone is asking about space weather and how it limits the efficiency of space logistics for multi-year missions. How does the tolerance of schedule drift compare against weather on Earth and in space? <clears throat> okay, so yeah, space weather, <clears throat> it's a big issue <clears throat> for communication satellites. It's a big, big issue for humans in space, especially, you know, uh, heavy charged particles like protons and so forth. Um, so I, I, I think we need to take space weather into account, you know, the 11 year cycle of the sun. But for cargo delivery in particular, I think it's going to have a minor impact. And, uh, and so I think as long as we time it well and we have enough shielding, uh, we should be able to manage. Okay, thank you for the answer. Other question, and um, I'm also excited to hear about your answer because I've been asked this question a few times. Um, does the mass advantage of using lunar-derived O2 remain if you increase the mass of getting the factory on the moon? 
Uh, yeah, that's that's a really great point. And um, in my charts, which um, Candice, I think we'll make those available. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we'll do our best for that. Okay, so I showed you a graph. It was very fast, but it was a zigzag chart uh, graph. And that graph, um, <clears throat> the metric is how many kilograms of oxygen can you produce per year, per Earth year, divided by the mass of the actual equipment to produce that oxygen. And so on the graph, we assumed a 10 to 1 ratio as the baseline. And we're not there yet technologically. We're maybe at 1 to 1 or 2 to 1. And so what we can, yes, we include that mass. You need to include that mass. And only when you reach a certain amount of productivity, kilograms of oxygen produced divided by the mass of the actual equipment, is it worthwhile doing? And we've shown that for, for the moon, that ratio is somewhere around 3.5. So if you can be better than about 3.5, it starts paying off. Okay, thank you for this clarification. Next question. Um, what do you think of the challenges of reliably landing in certain area of moon or on Mars? So decreasing the landing ellipse size as of today. Is such reliably landing for supply feasible? Yeah, I think, you know, 10 years ago, it was a bigger challenge. I think today with machine vision, with mm -hmm. precision control, machine learning, uh, you know, look at the, uh, the shrinking of the landing ellipse on, on Mars, which is harder, right? Because you're coming in at high velocity, you're coming in, um, you know, you, you have the atmospheric density fluctuations in Mars that are uncertain. So I think uh, precision lunar landing is easier robotically than on Mars because you have fewer. Now, the lighting is challenging, the thermal is challenging, but absolutely, I think precision landing is, is feasible, especially if you, if you begin the, land, the landing from a, a low lunar orbit, circular parking orbit. It's really uh, becoming quite feasible. And then let, let me get to the next question that is also about landing, about exploring. Is a, someone was asking in the best scenario that you presented, uh, can we even explore the dark side of the moon? Uh, well, first of all, there is no dark side of the moon, right? <laughs> Remember, there's a far side, but there is no dark okay. side. Um, but uh, but uh, can we explore the, yes, we can, That for sure we can. The main issue there is uh, communications back to Earth. So either you need to have high level of autonomy where the lander, the robotic systems can operate uh, pretty much on their own, or we need to build a relay satellite or uh, some kind of relay system to maintain a live link to Earth from the far side of the moon. So we need probably some combination of the two. Okay, yeah. And then another quick question on landing, and then we we'll go to other thematics. Do you think transporting the moon's human landing system along with the rover around the moon is realizable? Um, well, you know, this is a, an architectural question. Is it better to have fewer landings and put more on each lander, or is it better to have separate uh, landings and smaller, so we, we we preposition the rover, for example. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm actually a fan of smaller, more modular missions where you can preposition things, make sure everything checks out, then you send the next mission. So I, I personally prefer smaller missions that are more modular. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I have two questions. So one, I guess, is from someone from NASA who is uh, thanking you also for your outstanding talk. Um, and he's saying, so at NASA, we're working hard to drive competition to encourage innovation and push costs, costs lower. Do you have a feel for how many players we can sustain as this market grows? Obviously, a lot of private investment will be attracted as competition and profit can grow in this area. Okay, so a uh, shout out to NASA. I think it's uh, really great uh, to see the investment, you know, in the lunar ecosystem. Particularly, I want to mention one program that I think is exciting. It's called CLIPS. Uh, the CLIPS program is the Commercial Lunar 
uh, payload uh, services, which is kind of the equivalent of COTS, right, for ISS resupply. So I'm very excited about the CLIPS program. I'm not sure how many uh, players can, can you know, really be successful in it. I think we're going to see a lot of entrance. We're going to see a lot of competition. And like in many industries, you have a peak. And then, you know, the really successful players will survive and swallow some of the smaller players. And maybe we'll end up with, uh, um, I hate to say it, but maybe we'll end up with a duopoly, you know, like Boeing and Airbus in the, uh, in the commercial airplane world. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know that for sure, but it's quite likely. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Last question, and then we'll close this uh, Q&A. Um, how critical is in-space manufacturing in the short-term logistics? Um, you know, I think it's a great question. We're very interested in in-space manufacturing. I gave a talk, a different talk on this last week, um, and um, I'm very excited about it, particularly for Earth, you know, for Earth-bound applications. The closest thing that maps to what I talked about is planetary surface, so construction. So uh, sending construction equipment, say, to the lunar or Martian surface, and then using the regolith, you know, to build uh, caves, to build habitats, to build launch pads. So it's more like civil engineering. Uh, this is, I think, the most promising for the future. But do we need it as a precondition? I don't think so. I think only when we scale it up at massive scale, then it becomes helpful because then we decrease what we bring from Earth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. That's also a very good insight. And that reminds me also of uh, the uh, remarks from uh, Roxy yesterday, who's also an architect and was also talking about um, additive manufacturing for construction on the moon. 